Hello, and welcome to Denton's Tales of the Viking Age, which in this video deals with a remarkable military organization and a resulting campaign that lasted for 14 years and gave the Vikings a series of great victories, though ultimately ending in what was claimed by the Anglo-Saxons as a victory, but given the, the price they paid for it, victory doesn't really seem quite the right word. A victory usually entails getting whatever it is you were fighting for. But since the Vikings ended up with three quarters of what they had been fighting for, and the Anglo-Saxons achieved little more than a part of their objectives, it was hardly the great victory they claimed it was, although it has been hailed as such, and established the reputation of King Alfred the Great of Wessex. Now that reputation is hardly as well deserved as it would seem, from many history books. Fine leader, though he undoubtedly was, while the considerable later achievements of another ruler are generally ignored. But more of that later. Now, before I begin, however, there's something that I'd like to do. Something that means a great deal to me personally. I would like to dedicate this video to a very special friend, Crystal. One of the kindest, nicest, and funniest people I've ever known. A truly amazing person who brought joy and happiness into not only my own life, but into the lives of many others. Everyone who ever knew her loved her. Just looking at her photograph was enough to feel the, the beauty of her personality, her humour, her strength. Sadly, she crossed the Rainbow Bridge just a short time ago. She was only 32 years old. You know, she, she loved all things Norse and Germanic. I actually met her through my videos. She, she contacted me after seeing one of them. And had she lived in those times, she would without a doubt have been a shield maid. And she loved her cats, which gave her an affinity with Freya. So, Crystal, my dear friend, this video is for you. It is, it is appropriate because you were a true warrior in every sense, and I can think of nothing more fitting of what you were than to feast with Freya and Sestromir and ride with the Valkyria. You will always be in my heart and in the hearts of all who ever knew you. Farewell, my friend. Now, the great heathen army was the largest and most powerful, as well as the most influential force of Vikings ever to land in England, which it did in the year 865 AD, taking its name from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle entries of that year, which called it the Hafenhili, or the Heathen Army. Its size never equaled until 1066, when Duke William of Normandy landed to claim the English throne, defeating the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings. Ironically, of course, Duke William was himself a latter-day Viking, a descendant of those Norsemen who had settled years earlier in Francia, known to the Franks as the Normanni or Northmen, from which, of course, came the name Normandy. You could say it was a case of, hello, we're back. Now, we, we, we don't know the exact size of the Great Army. Some scholars put it as low as a thousand, though given the things it accomplished against several Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, each of which could have put far more men into battle than that number. In fact, the feared of a large district could comprise thousands of men, and the losses the army would have suffered in each successive battle, such a small force seems highly unlikely, and it is generally accepted that it must have been of considerable size. The Anglo-Saxon term Hiri was defined in the law code of the Kingdom of Wessex as a foreign invading force or a raiding party consisting of more than 35 men, while the Saxon army was referred to as the Fiat, which I've already referred to myself, a sort of citizen's militia, not unlike the Minutemen of the early days of the United States. The assembly of armed men called up by a thane or a king in time of war, comprising all able-bodied men who were able to bear arms, who would support the professional soldiers, the household troops of the nobles. Now, the, the men of the field were not proper soldiers. They were not highly trained and fully armoured and equipped with the finest weapons. No, they, they were farmers, craftsmen, artisans. Few would have had any armour as such. 
things like chainmail, helmets, and shields, would generally have been the prerogative of the professional soldiers, the household troops of the king or the thanes. And the feared would have been armed with a, a variety of both military and non-military weapons. Spears and some swords, hay forks, scythes, sickles, various types of axes, knives, hunting bows, just about anything really that could be used as a weapon. Some men would have acquired helmets or chainmail or, or good quality weapons, of course, from previous battles, but by and large the feared was, well, they were just a bunch of peasants. An armed rabble, if you like, but a dangerous one nonetheless, even if only by sheer weight of numbers, especially when directed by experienced warriors. And many of these men would have been very efficient fighters, untrained or not. You know, you didn't really survive well in the ninth century by being a pushover. No. The royal household troops, or those of the thanes, were of course fully professional. They were well-trained, well-armed soldiers equipped with armor, helmets, and shields, as well as swords, axes, spears, and war bows. They were a very formidable force, and with the feared behind them, they were something to be reckoned with. That is one way we know that the, the great heathen army must have been a considerable size, since they defeated several of these Anglo-Saxon armies a number of times, and would have suffered well, numerous casualties each time they did so. So, as I've already pointed out, they must have had sufficient strength to absorb those casualties initially and been able to obtain reinforcements later on. Clearly, the great heathen army was far more than a small raiding party. The Viking, or more correctly, I suppose we should say the Norse military machine, was similar to that of the Anglo-Saxons. They had professional soldiers who acted as the personal household troops of the kings and the important jarls, guarded forts and harbors, superbly equipped with the finest arms and armor, backed up by ordinary men called up to assist, much like the field. However, many of those men would have also been raiders, men who would have been well-armed and well, extremely good fighters, used to actual combat. The professional soldiers wouldn't have gone on raids, unless the king or the jarl had uh, done so that they served. And most of the men who went raiding would have been farmers and craftsmen, fishermen, or laborers when they weren't raiding, much like the men of the feared. But that meant that a considerable number of ordinary men had the skills of warriors. They were warriors, in fact, even if only part-time ones. That would have given them an edge over many of the feared, who wouldn't have had that kind of combat experience. But, of course, that isn't to say that the feared wasn't a dangerous force, as I've said it was. Several thousand armed men, trained warriors or not, rushing at you with the intention of killing you, even if they only had, well, farmyard implements to do it with, was hardly a thing to be ignored. And no Norse leaders would have underestimated that. But what sort of equipment would the great army have fought with? Well, for a start, the Vikings did not, of course, wear horned helmets. No. Contrary to, to popular belief and innumerable illustrations in books, that is something we owe to Herr Richard Wagner, or, or more correctly, I suppose, the theatrical costume designers and illustrators of his operas in the popular press, especially Der Ring das Nibelungen, the Ring of the Nibelungs, based as it is on the old Norse saga of the Volsungs, and on medieval operas like Lohengrin and Tannhäuser. At the time of the great heathen army, a typical Viking helmet would have looked like this reproduction, which is quite a good one. Now this is um, this is known as an ocular helmet from the two the two eye holes. It is very very much uh, the sort of helmet that would have been worn by most men. There are there are differing styles. Here is a, here is another one. Again, the ocular eye holes, but this one's slightly more elaborate, a little more, a little more decorated. Now, earlier, earlier on, helmets like this were worn. This helmet dates from the Vendel era, as it's uh, called. That is the period before the Viking Age. As see, also an ocular type helmet, but much more much more elaborate uh, than the later styles. It had these side guards, chain mail, and it was quite uh, quite well decorated. Uh, I'm quite sure though there would have been a number of these helmets still around during the Viking Age, handed down from father to son. That would seem logical. Then we have this. Now this is the nasal helmet. 
uh, which takes its name rather obviously I suppose from the nose guard here. Uh, this would have been an extremely common type of helmet and Anglo-Saxon helmets would have been very much the same. This actually gave very good protection as it happens and I know of one reenactment participant who avoided a broken nose or something even worse when he received a very heavy sword blow across the face and was saved by the nose guard. This uh, nasal type incidentally would become uh, famous as the helmet of the Normans. This being the, the type of helmet that was worn by the soldiers of Duke William of Normandy when he landed in England in 1066. Now this, this is a typical Viking sword. Many members of the great heathen army would have been armed with this type of weapon. Uh, it uh, has a three-lobed uh, pommel. This is a very common type of pommel. It's bound with leather. It has the small uh, guard. Uh, other, other swords would have had uh, maybe four or five uh, of the uh, lobes on them. Here is uh, another, another type of sword. This is slightly, slightly more elaborate. It's all metal. Um, this one actually is based on a sword that was found in Ireland. Uh, another, another example, much more elaborate, uh, is this one, where you have again the leather, uh, the leather bound grip, but a quite elaborately decorated guard, and the same for the, the pommel. There's also, now this sword, this sword is quite an interesting type because this is the kind of weapon that would have been carried by a Jarl, by a king, by a very prominent uh, warrior because it is far more elaborate. As you see again it has the, the leather grip but it has these uh, much more elaborate uh, fittings made in two parts and bolted together. So no what we might uh, term today uh, no sort of grunt common soldier would have been walking around with something like that. Unless, of course, he took it off somebody he'd, he'd just killed. There were also uh, axes. Uh, this would be a sort of an average sized axe. Some of them, some of them uh, known as the Dane axe, were mounted on a shaft about four feet long, which would have given tremendous force to any swing. And then there were special throwing axes, such as uh, this one, which is actually superbly balanced uh, for throwing. And that would have given you quite a considerable headache. Uh, there were then, of course, uh, spears, bows, and, and the like, which I don't have examples of. Now, people often seem to think that every Norseman went off raiding and pillaging. That's all they did. 365 days a year, raiding, pillaging, raping, etc. But that's not the case. For every man who sailed off in a dragon ship to go raiding, thus becoming a Viking, since to be a Viking or Viking or as it was in old Norse, one had to get in a ship and go off somewhere and do something. For every one of those men, there would have been several who didn't. And raiding usually occurred during the summer when there was good sailing weather. But enough men would have gone raiding to provide a strong core of very proficient warriors if there was a general call to arms. And the purpose of the great heathen army was not just to acquire treasure, which had been the main reason for raiding, but also land, lands to settle on and raise crops and families. So there would have been no shortage of men volunteering to join, and women too, since families frequently followed their men under those circumstances. And we know from archaeological evidence that a great many women and children accompanied the great heathen army. A couple of women even commanded their own ships on other occasions. Raiding, fighting, minor settlement, and even trading and peaceful coexistence on occasions had been going on between the Norse and the English ever since the first major Viking raid on the country back in 793 AD, which marks the beginning of the so-called Viking Age, when the monastic island of Lindisfarne, or Lindisfarne as it is now in Northumbria, was sacked and burned. That was an event that sent shockwaves through Anglo-Saxon England, destroying, as it did, the much-venerated shrine of St. Cuthbert. 
But while Viking raids have been almost constant since that time, the great heathen army was something new. This was a, a major military force that didn't just grab and run, didn't come for gold and silver, precious jewels or slaves, and didn't run back to ships and sail away before an effective resistance could be mounted or hold some territory close to the sea for easy escape if necessary. No, no, no. It camped. It marched inland. It, it wintered before resuming its activities. It was a conquering force in much the same way as had been the Roman legions centuries before. It wasn't going anywhere. It was there to stay. A number of leaders headed the great army, one of them crossing the Irish Sea from Dyflin, or Dublin, as it is today. A man who had become a legend in his own lifetime and whose name still reverberates down the ages to the present day. Ivar Ragnarsson, better known as Ivar in Bainlossi, or Ivar the Boneless, who had become joint king of Dyflin along with Olaf the White in 863 AD. Initially raiding across County Meath, plundering Celtic tombs in the Boyne Valley, and engaging in considerable warfare with Irish chieftains as a result, before leaving to join the assault on England along with his brother Uba. Though Olaf returned to Ireland quite soon, Eva remained until 871, returning to Dyflin a few years before his death, which is said to have occurred around 873 AD, though we can't be completely sure. Since Ivar is shrouded in legend and mythology as well as actual history. Even his boneless status is questionable, since some sources say he had no bones or just cartilage in his legs and had to be carried around, while another says he was impotent, that his bonelessness was just a figure of speech, a non-existent deformity that was used to cover the embarrassing fact that he, uh, well, he, he couldn't get it up, so to speak. But either way, Ivar's arrival is chronicled by the Anglo-Saxon historian Ethelred, who wrote, The fleets of the Viking tyrant Hingwar landed in England from the north. Hingwar being the Anglo-Saxon name for Ivar. Halfdan Ragnarsson was another early leader of the great army, said to be a brother of Ivar and Uber, though that is open to question since their supposed father, Ragnar Sigurdsson, or Ragnar Rothbrook, as he is usually known, didn't actually exist. Ragnar being a composite figure, made up from several real-life Viking leaders who lived over a, a considerable period of time. The legendary version of the Great Heathen Army was that it was led by the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok to seek revenge on King Ela of Northumbria, who was said to have killed Ragnar in 865 AD by chucking him into a pit of vipers. The Great Heathen Army being led by the brothers Ivar the Boneless, Huber, Halfdan, Bjorn Ironside, Pitzerk, and Sigurd Snake in the Eye. Now, the first four of these men are known to be genuine historical figures. They were real. Though the other two are rather well, less, they're less certain. And of course, none of them had any actual blood relationship to Ragnar, since Ragnar was a composite figure. He didn't actually exist. Though they may well have been related to each other, and having them related also to a famous figure like the legendary Ragnar made, well, that made a very good story later on. As I've said, it, it's quite possible that Ivar, Halfdan, Uber, and Bjorn were genuinely brothers. Their father could even have been called Ragnar, thus giving them the name Ragnarsson. But he would be a Ragnar, not the Ragnar. And by the way, the surname was Ragnarsson for the supposed sons of the fictional hero, not Rothbrook, since Rothbrook was a nickname meaning Hairy Bridges from trousers he was said to have worn on one occasion and had nothing to do with his actual name, just as Bjorn's name was Bjorn Ragnarsson, not Bjorn Ironside, which was a nickname. Much of the force landed initially in the Kingdom of East Anglia, a section of the English coast that jutted out into the North Sea, making it a, a perfect landing place for ships coming down from Scandinavia, and comprised the modern-day counties of Norfolk, Suffolk, and Cambridgeshire, where King Edmund rather foolishly tried appeasement rather than resistance, deciding for some reason best known to himself not to strike the invaders when they would have been at their weakest, coming ashore and establishing their force on land, but instead offering them horses in return for peace, which they accepted. The great army spending some time at Thetford before marching north. By November of 866, they reached the Anglo-Saxon trading city of Eofowick, modern-day York, in the Kingdom of Northumbria, which they would rename Yorvik. Now, this was a very important city, located at the confluence of the rivers Ouse and Foss, which merged with other rivers before flowing down to the Humber and out into the North Sea, making it a thriving port and the access point to much of northern England. Controlled Jorvik 
and you controlled Northumbria. The Norse attacked on the 1st of November, which just happened to be All Saints Day, a very important Christian festival which would be attended by everyone who was anyone. All important city leaders and officials, military commanders and prominent citizens would be in the cathedral. And this may well have been the reason for the attack on that day, taking the city leaders by surprise. Or of course it may have been just a coincidence, but that does seem rather unlikely. The Norsemen gathered information as they moved, and I'm sure they would have been very well aware of Christian festivals. In any case, the assault was fast and effective, and they captured the city quite easily, though the two kings who ruled in Northumbria, Ayla and Osbert, escaped. Taking the city gave the great army a dominance over most of northern England, right up to the Scottish border, and Yorick would become a major centre of Norse occupation and trade for a couple of centuries afterwards. The army wintered on the River Tyne, but with most of the force absent, there was an uprising against them in Yorvik, incited by, of course, Ayla and Osbert, who attempted to reconquer the city, forcing the Vikings to retake it in 867, which they did without too much difficulty, but in a far more violent and bloody battle than the one previously, during which the two kings were killed. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle recorded that there was extensive slaughter made of the Northumbrians, after which Halfdan shared out the lands of the Northumbrians and they decided to plough and to support themselves. Some 150 years later, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle also stated that the Vikings rebuilt the city of York, cultivated the land around it and remained there. Without any leadership, all resistance to the Norsemen ceased and a local puppet uh, king, Egbert, was installed in Jorvik. Though, of course, he had no actual power himself. He was simply there to pass on orders from the Norsemen and to collect taxes to further the great army. Later on, Halfdan himself was named the first Norse king of Northumbria. He also had pretensions to the kingdom of Diffin, based on Ivar's previous rule, but that, um, uh, that didn't work out quite so well, as we shall see. In 867, the great army marched into the kingdom of Mercia, capturing the city of Nottingham, where they spent the winter. King Burgred of Mercia requested assistance from Ethelred, king of Wessex, and a joint Mercian and West Saxon force besieged Nottingham, but without any real result, the great army was still there, nothing had changed, and King Burgred decided to buy the Norsemen off, agreeing a, a truce with them that saw them return to Northumbria in the autumn of 868, where they remained, gathering strength for their next campaign. Now that took them back again to East Anglia, where they'd started out. The invasion of East Anglia was launched in 869, with the intention this time of full conquest, no, no peace deals in return for horses, seizing the town of Thetford. King Edmund at last decided to put up a fight and arrived with an army, but it didn't achieve very much. He was captured and killed. Following his death, Edmund was declared a martyr for the faith since tradition had it that he refused Danish demands to renounce Christ, and that Ivar and Uber were responsible for his death. One story being that he was shot full of arrows like St. Sebastian, after telling the Norsemen how God had protected the saint, and Ivar decided to see if God would do the same for Edmund. He didn't. Well, that's, that's the legend. Exactly how he died in the battle or afterwards, well, we really don't know for certain, or what part Halfdan played in the event, well, that's not even mentioned. Edmund was reburied in 903 at a monastery in the town of Beodixworth, and great miracles were said to have been performed by the martyred king at his graveside, so much so that the place was named St. Edmund's Bury in 925, and later became the town known today as Bury St. Edmund's. With the departure of Ivar the Boneless back to Ireland, Halfdan became principal leader of the great army and its numbers were, were greatly increased by the arrival of reinforcements under King Baxic of Denmark, what uh, later became known as the Great Summer Army, Halfdan and Baxic preparing with their greater numbers to invade the southern kingdom of Wessex, which they did over the winter of 870 to 871, camping at Reading in what is now the county of Berkshire. The camp was very well placed, depend, uh, defended on two sides by the Kennet and Thames rivers, and on the third side by an earthen embankment. The first engagement between the Great Army and the West Saxons occurred on January the 4th, 871, at nearby Engelfield, when a small Danish force was driven back by Æthelwulf, the elderman of the Shire. Four days later, he was joined by the main West Saxon army under King Æthelred and his brother Alfred, 
and an assault was lodged against the rampart. A bloody battle ensued, but the Saxons were unable to penetrate the Norse defences and they were driven back, Aethelwulf being among the dead, leaving the great army free to continue its march further into Wessex. But Ethelred and Alfred reformed their army, retreating up into the Berkshire Downs, and only a few days later won a considerable victory at the Battle of Ashdown on the 8th of January. It was a very costly victory, however, considerably weakening Ethelred's forces. But the Danes were able to recover after receiving reinforcements and engaged the, Saxon, uh, the West Saxons, I should say, again on January the 22nd at the Battle of Bassing and on the 22nd of March in the Battle of Martin, in which they were at first driven back but rallied and attacked the West Saxons with what the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle called much slaughter, with Bishop Haymond among the dead, who features in the television series Vikings. Neither engagement was merely decisive, however, with both sides weakened, but still each well able to take the field. And on the 15th of April, King Athelred died, whether from injuries sustained in the battle or not is unclear, being succeeded by his brother, later, of course, to be known as Alfred the Great. Alfred decided to buy the Norsemen off, paying them to halt their advance, since defeating them decisively seemed out of the question, and a further battle would probably simply weaken his forces. The great army remained at Reading until late in 871. Then they took up winter quarters in London before returning to Northumbria in 872. Then they returned to Mercia, establishing winter quarters at Torxey on the river Trent in the minor kingdom of Lindsay in present-day Lincolnshire, where they remained until the Mercians paid them to go away, which they did towards the end of 873. Their camp at Torxey has been excavated recently. It was found to have been enormous, later the, uh, larger than, than those cities of the day, in fact, covering an area of over 130 acres. And there was considerable evidence of the presence of women and children and of metalworking and other day-to-day -day activities. After leaving Torxey, the army moved further down the Trent River to Repton in present-day Derbyshire, where they remained from the winter. Another impressive camp was set up at Ripton, again like the Torxian encampment, a type of fortification that was known as a Langfot or a Longport. Uh, this one, more or less D-shaped rampart, comprising an earthen bank with a wooden palisade on top and a ditch as well, forming the curve of the D with the straight part formed by the River Trent itself. And the Repton fort cleverly incorporated a Christian church into its defences, the building lying lengthways almost at the centre of uh, and in the earthen rampart forming the D. And it's thought that its doors provided an easily defended access into the enclosure, a sort of ready-made gatehouse, if you like, a fine example of utilising local features to assist with the construction. Not only did the church provide a, a gateway feature, incorporating it into the outer defences that they had, but it saved having to build quite a considerable length of rampart. The camp has been excavated starting in the 1970s, and it's one of the few long ports to be discovered. And there was a bit of a surprise awaiting the researchers. At one time it was thought that the camp had been entirely within the defensive rampart, but archaeologists from Bristol University found that extensive structures existed beyond the rampart, including ship repair yards and metalworking sites, as had been the case at Torxey. They found special rogue nails used in the construction of ships, battle axes, arrows, and, and gaming pieces made out of lead, as well as a mass grave containing over 260 bodies. The Repton camp is a very considerable site in Viking history. In 874, the great army moved against Mercia once again, no longer interested in, in just a payment to go away. This time it was conquest or nothing. King Burgred's forces were defeated, and the king himself fled into exile after reigning for over twenty-two year, or over twenty years, I should say, being replaced with a puppet ruler, a thane named Seolf, who ruled Mercia for the Norsemen until his death in 879. Uh, this, this is an account of these events as given in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which states, This year went the army from the kingdom of Lindsay to Repton, and there took up their winter quarters drove the king Burgred over the sea when he had reigned about two and twenty winters and subdued all that land. He then went to Rome and there remained to the end of his life and his body lies in the church of Santa Maria in the school of the English nation. And in the same year they gave Seawolf, an unwise king's thane, the Mercian kingdom to hold and he swore oaths to them 
and gave hostages, that it should be ready for them on whatever day they would have it, and that he would be ready with himself and all those that would remain with him at the service of the army. After the victory over Mercia, the great army, rather unwisely, I should think, split into two groups, one under the command of Guthrum, moved south to continue the attack on Wessex, taking up quarters at Cambridge in East Anglia, while the other half, under Halfdan, went north to attack the Scottish Picts and the Britons of Strathclota, or Strathclyde as it is today, and also to pursue his claim to the kingdom of Diffin, which he now considered should be his following the death of Ivar the previous year. Guthrum's group remained at Cambridge for that winter. Then late in 875 he moved to Wareham, fortified it, and began raiding across the surrounding countryside. He had sailed around Pool Harbour to join another Norse force that had landed between the Fram and Piddle rivers, defeating Alfred's forces and capturing a fortress as well as a convent of nuns. He was in a very, very strong position, already having acquired parts of Mercia and Northumbria, and Alfred negotiated a truce with him, getting him to agree to leave Wessex as part of a peace settlement. The army moved out of Wareham, but by 877, Guthrum was raiding across parts of Wessex once again. Alfred's forces confronted him a number of times, but Guthrum was able to overpower them and continued his raids, capturing the town of Exeter, where Alfred once again negotiated a peace agreement, resulting in Guthrum leaving Wessex to winter in the city of Gloucester in Mercia. The 6th of January, 878, Epiphany in the church calendar. King Alfred and his court were staying at Chippenham in Wiltshire, not expecting trouble of any kind. It was a Christian holy day, and the very pious would have, Alfred would have had his mind totally on religious observances. But during the night, the Danes mounted a surprise attack, designed no doubt to kill or capture Alfred and give them Wessex once and for all. There is speculation that this attack was actually allowed by Wulfhir, the elderman of Wiltshire, though whether by intent or just sheer incompetence isn't known, but he was later stripped of his title by Alfred as a result, who had escaped the attack. The king and some of his retainers fled to the Somerset Marshes, taking refuge in the village of Atholi, where he built up his forces over the next few months while engaging in minor raids and skirmishes with Guthrum's men, but powerless to actually stop them. It is during his time in the marshes that Alfred was said to have burned the cakes that he was supposed to be watching for a woman, distracted by his own thoughts on the perilous situa uh, situation he faced. Well, there's no actual historical evidence for that whatsoever. Nice story, though. And the moral is, don't ask sulky kings and marshes to keep an eye on your baking. It's a bad idea. Whatever about the burnt cakes, in May of 878, Alfred called all those loyal to him to a place called Egbert Stone, and from there they marched to Eddington to confront Guthrum. The Battle of Eddington took place on an unknown date between the 6th and 12th of May, and the result was a victory for the West Saxons. Guthrum had already lost the support of several Norse leaders by that time, and, and many of the Norsemen had settled down on land in Mercia and East Anglia. Plus, the fact that a considerable number of men had been drowned when a fleet of 120 ships was destroyed by a violent storm off Swanage. Guthrum's thus weakened force was routed by Alfred's army, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles describing it thus, Fighting ferociously, forming a dense shield wall against the whole army of the pagans, and striving long and bravely, at last he gained the victory. He overthrew the pagans with great slaughter, and smiting the fugitives, he pursued them as far as the fortress. Dramatic stuff. Guthrum's men fled back into their encampment, where they were besieged by the Saxons for two weeks. With no ability to obtain supplies, Guthrum was starved into submission and forced to accept Alfred's terms, which resulted in the Treaty of Wedmore. The Treaty of Wedmore forced Guthrum to leave Wessex and never attack it again, but also established permanent borders between the West Saxon realm of Wessex and a huge area of England right up to the Scottish border, comprising East Anglia, much of Mercia and Northumberland, what would be known to, as the, the, the Danelaw to be ruled by the Norsemen and Guthrum himself was to accept baptism into the Christian faith. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle recorded the treaty in these words. Then the raiding army granted him hostages, and great oaths that they would leave his kingdom, and also promised that their king would receive baptism, and they fulfilled it. And three weeks later the King Guthrum came to him, one of thirty of the most honourable men who were in the raiding party at Allah, and that is near Athelney, 
and the king received him at baptism. Guthrum, under his new baptismal name, Athelstan, despite having been yeah, a bit lax to say the least in his observance of treaties up to then, fully honoured his side of the treaty, leaving the border between the Danelaw and Wessex unmolested, withdrawing his army to the lands that Alfred had granted him, first to Cirencester and Mercia, and in 879 moving to East Anglia, setting up the kingdom of Guthrum, where he lived until his death in 890 AD. Now he's said to have been buried at Hadley in modern-day Suffolk. Another Viking army had been gathering in 878 at Fulham on the Thames, but it was discouraged by Alfred's victory at Eddington, and they decided to leave England altogether, taking advantage of political insecurity across the sea in Francia, following the death of King Charles of the Bald, where they might find easier pickings. Did King Alfred actually win a resounding victory over Guthrum? Not really, when you actually think about it. Yes, he won a decisive battle and the Danes left Wessex, which saved his own kingdom, but at a terrible price, well, for other people at least. He gave the Danes the rest of England, kingdoms that, well, actually he had no legal right to give away, they weren't his. He didn't consult the East Anglians or the Mercians or the Northumbrians. He, he simply told Guthrum, here, there you go, you can have it, just stay away from Wessex, off you go. To my mind, Guthrum and other Norse leaders who set up their own areas of control were the real winners. Most of northern and eastern England was totally under their rule. The Treaty of Wedmore was a very self-centred one as far as Alfred went, but it saved Wessex, and that was all that interested him at that moment. Nor did he take any action later to regain any of the lost territory, though he always had a desire for a united Saxon England, confining his military efforts to fending off other Viking raiders who appeared from time to time, building a fleet of large warships and improving the coastal defences. But that, that was about it. Credit, uh, credit for actually trying to regain some lost territory must go to his daughter, Ethelfred of Mercia, who had later become ruler of that part of Mercia that lay outside the Danelaw on the death of her husband, and was one of the, the greatest rulers of pre-Norman England. A woman who showed the men how to do it in a very male-dominated age. A woman who was easily the equal of her father, and, and in some ways even better. The Lady of Mercia, as she became known, never accepted her father's actions. She rejected the Treaty of Wedmore, and, dressed in chainmail, personally led her armies into battle to regain territory lost to Mercia under the treaty. Her father is remembered today, the name of Alfred the Great, known to anyone with any interest in history, the man who defeated the Vikings. But his amazing daughter is largely unknown. The name of Ethelfred of Mercia meaning, meaning nothing to most people, despite her superb military accomplishments. That's a pity. She was a, a great woman and deserves to be remembered every bit as much as her father. But unfortunately, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, written as it was primarily for Wessex, downplayed her achievements, despite her being Alfred's daughter, because, well, she was, of course, a woman, but also because she ruled Mercia, not Wessex. But, I hear you say, well, what about Halfdan and the other half of the great army? Well, as well as raiding up into Scotland, he returned to Ireland for a short time and may, yeah, may have been responsible for the suspicious death in 875 of King Eystein Olafsson, ruler of the Kingdom of Dublin, who had succeeded Ivar. Deceitfully killed, according to the records of the time, by one the Irish called Alban, which is generally considered to have been Halfdan, who considered himself the rightful king of Difflin. Halfdan didn't remain in Ireland, however, returning with his army to Northumbria in 876 and declaring himself king of Yorick, and, of course, of Northumbria as well, in the same year. His rule in Difflin was opposed, however, and his absence in England led to a rising against him, which resulted in his leaving Yorvik and returning to Ireland in 877, landing in the north of that country. He was met, however, by a very strong force of Norsemen who opposed him, those who had been living in Ireland for a considerable time and resented him as a newcomer, Halfdan being killed in the resulting Battle of Strangford Loch. The Annals of Ulster describing the engagement a skirmish at Loch Cuan between the fair heathens and the dark heathens, in which Alban, king of the dark heathens, fell. The annals were, it seems, using the terms fair and dark, normally used by the Irish to describe Norwegians and Danes, to describe the settled Norse from the newly arrived Halfdan and his men. And Loch Cuan was the Gaelic name for what would later be known as Strangford Loch. 
The survivors of Halfdan's army returned to Scotland, where they had already been campaigning, and headed south for Northumbria. On the way, they fought a battle against the Picts, in which the Pictish king Constantine I was killed. Halfdan, Halfdan would have done much better had he stayed with Guthrum, and perhaps together they could have conquered Wessex, since Guthrum, even on his own, had come so close to putting all of England under Norse rule. With Wessex defeated, Halfdan could then have pursued his Irish ambitions perhaps more successfully. Thus ends the saga of the great heathen army, though not a conflict between Norse and Saxon. The army that had gathered in 878 at Fulham and then left for Francia returned in 892 with 250 ships and set up a camp at Appledore in Kent, while a short time later a further 80 ships arrived at Milton Regis. The two now considerably large forces posing a very serious threat to the West Saxons. They launched a number of attacks against Wessex, but they didn't really achieve the results they had hoped for, since the Saxon defences had been so considerably improved over the years, and they eventually they got tired of the seemingly futile combat, disbanding in 896. Many of them settled in Northumbria and East Anglia, adding to the growing numbers of settlers coming over from Scandinavia to consolidate the Dane law, while others returned to Francia. With that, I shall say farewell, and goodbye until next time. Bye for now.